Hey everyone, welcome back to the arena. I'm MD, joined here by Kobe, as well as, once again, a special guest that we can't wait to have a great conversation with. Love and appreciation to those who are listening. What's up, everybody? Uh, like MD said, got another great guest here across the globe. Uh, we have Cal McPherson. He is in Australia right now, so it is 6-ish p.m. on a Thursday here in the States, and... 10 a.m., 10.30 a.m., something like that, then the following morning. So Cal has started his Friday morning already. Um, Cal is the founder and host of Young Blood Men's Mental Health. Uh, I was who he had me on. Go listen to it. It's a fun conversation. He's a great interviewer, uh, which is a volunteer podcast for Young Men's Mental Health. Uh, he's also a media and production officer, and uh, it's an award-winning podcast in Australia and in doing just really remarkable things and spreading mental health and men's mental health awareness. So without further ado, Cal, why don't you just share a little bit more about who you are and how you got to where you are today? No worries. So thanks so much for having me on, guys. I love what you guys are doing over in the, the US and the more people we can have having these kinds of conversations across the world, the more of a, an impact we can make. So we're all... Uh, part of the change so you respect to you guys for the input that you're having so i started my podcast four and a half years ago and that was off the back of losing a good friend of mine to suicide which unfortunately a lot of us have experienced that was something that was totally unexpected for me totally out of left field and it completely rocked my world and took off the the rose tinted glasses um, my friend james we called him JMO was the most resilient, strong-willed, compassionate, good-humoured guy that you would ever meet. And if you would have asked me, I would have said he would be the, the most likely to succeed out of everyone that I know. So I think that's the thing with suicide. The stereotype is that it's um, someone who's depressed alone in their room with the shades drawn and, and has nothing going for them. But often it's, uh, it can be the opposite. And we just it's so hard to recognise. So when that happened... Uh, yeah, that totally changed my worldview. It was the first time that I'd lost someone suddenly and I could see the impact uh, not only on me but on his family and probably a hundred plus people around him in his circle and just how devastating that was. And uh, in grieving that, I, uh, I decided that we needed to have a platform to share these conversations and actually get men, in particular young men, to talk about what's really going on in their lives because I think... We're all familiar with the fact that as young guys, we like to have that, that veneer, the exterior of bravado and acting like we're real tough and nothing phases us and it's all good, bro, no matter what. But often we're hiding what's going on underneath the surface. And in some cases, you know, we'd rather go to our grave than tell people how we're really feeling and, and what's really going on. And that's, that's truly the, the tragedy in all this. So I wanted to create a space for men to be able to come and share those stories and not be ashamed uh and so that's where where the idea for the the podcast came from and so like what are you feeling in that moment like you 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 find this out you know you're you're about your your friend like what's running through your head because i can't even imagine especially the way you describe this person as someone compassionate resilient would have never thought in a million years that this would happen like just kind of help us understand like where your head's at and um, just, yeah, just could you kind of talk through that because that's, uh, you know, I'm trying to picture, I, I can't obviously, but uh, just talk through that. Yeah, so that moment I was actually halfway through a shift. I used to be a TV news reporter. Uh, it was mid-morning. I'd uh, been working since 6 a.m. and I got a, a phone call from... Uh, someone else I know who'd been away with this friend of mine and had he just told me that JMO's gone, JMO's passed away. And my I still get goosebumps thinking about it now. My my response was, What do you mean? Because that just doesn't compute. I was like, What the fuck are you talking about? Because <laughs> you just your brain can't process it. And he said, He's you know, he's dead, he's died, he's gone. And then I just went into total shock, which I'd never experienced before. Uh, just this complete rush of emotions where you just can't respond. You don't know what's going on. Uh, and you start to 
yeah, basically freak out, like start uh, sobbing and shaking like uncontrollably as your brain's scrambling to try to work out and make sense of what you've just been told. And anyway, I um, initially I tried to I tried to keep working, but I um, I couldn't. I, I I yeah fell apart, and then I had to get driven home by my cameraman that day. Uh, and then spent the next 24 hours just like totally beside myself and unable to really react or respond because um, it was just yeah such a shock unlike anything else and where were you at you know in your kind of in your life before this happened and did this offer you like a learning or an opportunity to like look inwardly and be more honest with yourself and evaluate yourself on like how am I truly doing because clearly this is somebody at a surface that you would never suspect would do something like this to themselves. Like, did you have to look inwardly in yourself and really give yourself that sort of evaluation? Yeah, well, to that point, I just, I guess I felt like bad things didn't happen to good people. And I'd been privileged enough to have a, a really good upbringing where nothing horrific had happened to me. Um, so this was the first time being shown like, people can die well before they're supposed to and people that you love can be gone in the in the snap of their of fingers and you don't actually have control over everything i think as humans we're pretty good at deluding ourselves into thinking that we have control and as long as we do the right things you know nothing bad's going to happen but the reality is we don't we don't have control and that's a pretty freaky thing to consider so I think it was destabilizing in realizing that, holy shit, like, you know, I'm not a kid anymore. We're in the adult world and anything can happen to anyone at any time, uh, whether they're good or they're bad or they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And I guess it made me take my life more seriously. Like I'd, I'd been uh, taking my, my health more for granted at that stage in my life, uh, doing lots of lots of partying and, and lots of frivolity and uh, sort of just expecting that it was going to be all good no matter what I did and, and that typical young man sense of invincibility that we have where uh, we think we're kings just based off the fact that like nothing bad's happened to us so far and uh, so I guess I got a bit more serious after this happened and I also got a sense of wanting to do something to uh, to make my, my friend's life not that his life didn't mean anything anyway, of course it did, but just to try to make uh, a positive out of such a terrible tragedy, a, t a terrible negative. Um, so I guess it made, me, it made me grow up a bit and made me realize the, the seriousness of life and also grasp the, the opportunities that I've got and not, and not take them for granted. And then obviously it helped drive you into a mission of starting you know, a podcast and you felt a very strong purpose to build something out from this. I'm just curious, like before something like this happened, like how has your perspective and understanding of depression evolved from before and after? Like what were you, uh, yeah, I guess how has your perspective evolved there? Yeah, so I guess I hadn't really thought about mental health that much before this happened. Like I'd always been all right and uh, I understand you have days where you feel a bit down and, and days where you feel really good. But I didn't, I, I hadn't been fully depressed before. I'd gone through breakups and felt shit and I'd seen other, other friends, you know, have, have some bad days, but I didn't have an understanding of it. And I didn't know how well people can hide, hide depression and, and hide how they're, they're really feeling deep down. We're so good at wearing a mask. Um, and then, yeah, after this happened, I, I realized that for like a lot of people, it's, it's chemical. There's, there's a lot going on in your brain chemistry, which can be genetic. That has a huge impact on how you feel day to day. And that's why I'm trying to say uh, uh, depression is just a state of mind and you can just snap out of it and just get motivated and be positive. And if you're depressed, that's your fault because you're weak. And I, I think that's absolute bullshit. There's plenty of people who are just wired a certain way where it's going to be much harder for them. But that said, there's, there's always actions that we can take no matter who we are to try to better our mindset and, and give ourselves the best chance of, of living well and, and feeling well um, mentally. But I, yeah, I certainly, I realized that people can be depressed and seriously, severely depressed to a dangerous level and you might have no idea.
Uh, Cal, can you just talk a little bit more for people that are maybe, to, I would assume this would help people maybe feel a little bit less alone and also for, educate others that maybe haven't had to go through like the grieving process and kind of what that looked like for you, um, what's involved, how are you feeling on good days, bad days, just kind of talk through that, that journey. Yeah, so you often hear grief described as waves, and I certainly related to that. So initially, it's like one wave after another crashing down on you, and you don't really get a moment to breathe, and you're just being overwhelmed by an ocean of these feelings and just like a crushing weight, really. So it definitely felt like that for a couple of days, and then... As time goes on, there's still waves, but they just start to hit you more infrequently. So, uh, you know, after after weeks, it was still something that I was thinking about from the moment I, I woke up and most of the day. And then after months, again, it was still something that was on my mind every day. And then after after years, it's something that, I'll hear a song that will remind me of him or uh, something will happen and I'll have a, I'll think that I want to go and tell him that or uh, I'll hear his voice at a particular moment and then that will spark that, those feelings in me. So the, uh, I think the important thing to remember is that, like, like they say, all the cliches are true, time heals all wounds. I don't know if it, it, it heals the wounds to the point where it's perfectly healed. I, I think we certainly carry scars forever, but it's not going to feel as crushing and as hopeless as it does initially. It's not going to feel like that forever. And I think that's the real fear for people when you're experiencing that level of grief and loss. Initially, it's just so terrible to feel that way that you can't imagine how you're going to keep feeling like that. And no matter what it is, it does get better. It doesn't get perfect. Like you're still going to carry that for the rest of your life. But the perspective does change over time and you are able to manage. And now five years later, I just visited his grave the other day because it was the five year anniversary. And, um, you know, I still feel him with me. And I choose to take the positive in that because that's all there is. That's all there is to take. So I try to embody some of the traits that he had and have him live on through me. And the fact that I still shed a tear now thinking about him, I see as a, a beautiful thing because it means that, you know, he's still there in my heart. So that's how I choose to look at it. Yeah, that, that I mean, that that's super powerful. And, and like when you say, carry these feelings come up, can you just like like what what's what are you feeling like how does it feel in your body like just kind of talk through like you said at first it's like waves of the, the these feelings i assume of like sadness and despair but just kind of talk through a little bit more about that well i think the hardest thing initially is going around and around and around in circles in your head trying to figure out why you know especially when it's suicide because it's so hard not to blame yourself. If you're close to someone and they choose to end their life and you were someone that they told things to that they didn't really tell anyone else, it's hard not to feel guilty like you could have, you could have stopped that from happening. So you spend a lot of time being like, why didn't he call me? Why didn't I call him? You know, why, didn't I, why didn't I go there? Why didn't he say this to me? Uh, and the most frustrating part of it is you can't actually answer those questions but you'll drive yourself mad trying to probably, you know, maybe, maybe for years, maybe forever. Um, you can keep going around and around in your head. And what the place that you have to arrive at is accepting that at the end of the day, everyone's responsible for themselves and there's nothing that you could have done to save someone in that position. I mean, you can know that logically, but there's still part of you that's going to really grapple with, okay, but is that true? And that's, that's so hard when we talk about grief and especially suicide is to come to peace with that as much as you can. And I, I have as much as I can, but look, I, I still know, know people who've lost family members to suicide and, and they're in that same position and they still very much struggle with, yeah, but I should have saved him. I should have, I should have, I should have. I should have. Uh, and I think that's, that's the most brutal part of it. But ultimately you've got to, 
you got to make peace with it and you got to accept that like you did all you could and you got to think about all the good things that you did bring to that person's life uh, rather than the fact that you weren't there in that moment and you could have changed fate, you know, because it's just too much for anyone to carry on their shoulders. And in your perspective, why is it that people don't go and talk about it or ask for the help or open up about it or give warning? Yeah. Uh, shame. 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 Feeling like a burden, especially for men. And that's why we see, well, here in Australia, it's nine people die per day by suicide and seven of them are, are men. So by far, the rate of male suicide outweighs female. And I think that's because of the, the burden of expectation that we put on ourselves as men and conditioning in society where if you're a man, you're supposed to have it handled. Whatever it is, you're supposed to shut up and carry it and get the job done. And no one wants to hear you bitch about it. Uh, and even if that's a, a very legitimate thing that you need to be able to talk to someone to be able to process your thoughts and, and be able to get another perspective. I think a lot of us have that voice in our head where it's just like, nah, you're a man. You don't need to talk about that shit, no matter what it is. And we might've got that from our dad. We might've got that from just general culture. We, we might've got that through our peer group, you know, but that's that, that's that voice we have in our head, which is, it would be worse for me to admit this than it would be to just keep on suffering it uh, and not have people find out that actually I'm not uh, impermeable. And like, <clears throat> it's interesting because you can find it in like our, our linguistics, like the way we speak, you know, when we talk about complaining or whining, we call it bitching, right? Which is a feminine term or when yeah. a guy is acting scared, we call them a pussy, right? It's like, these are very feminine terms used to describe ultimately what is very nature or natural to a human being right so it's like in your perspective like what does that look like every day for a man and and, and what is the temperature of, of being a man in, in australia how how pertinent is that stigma i think it's very pertinent i think we are making some inroads and some progress slowly although we're not seeing that in the statistics yet but we've got a hyper-masculine culture here generally. I've had guests on the show who talk about the fact that Aussie men are, are raised to drink beer and gamble and sleep with as many women as possible and play footy. You know, not all that different to blokes in the US, I suppose. Uh, but that traditional hyper-masculine culture of harden up, don't cry, don't talk about how you're feeling just keep keep drinking and be tough and be the most athletic like that's definitely still out there and that's something that we're working to to try to uh try to come up with a with an alternative but then it's also like we're not saying any of those any of those things are, are wrong obviously uh within uh moderation like i think part of this is we don't want to feminize men and say oh you, you're supposed to be more like women and, and you should stop wanting to be strong and resilient and assertive and aggressive and tough and you should just be vulnerable that, that doesn't work either and I think that's not the message we're trying to get across what, what we're trying to say is be yourself lean into all those masculine qualities that come naturally to you that you should have but then also have the capacity to be honest with yourself when stuff's going on inside of you and you're not okay and it's leading you down a dark road or you're acting out in a way that's not like you and it's having negative consequences, be able to wise up in that moment and be self-aware and say, I've got something going on that I actually need to confront and have the balls to confront it for your own good and the good of those around you. And actually, I think it takes the most strength to have that self-awareness and rather than shy away from those things and distract ourselves with all of these uh, negative things that we can get into, but actually face that, I think that's the most masculine thing that we can do and that's what we want to get into people's thinking I think I think that was one of the most well articulated uh, at least for for me um, what it means to be a man and what it means to be strong uh, in what is strength and, and, and what is not um, that that was very well said I guess what have you learned? Because you, you know, our podcast is centered around mental health, but we, we have a broad range of guests. 
uh, women, men from all across the country with different backgrounds. Your podcast is very focused on young men with that have struggled with their mental health and their stories. So what have you learned about men's mental health through the podcast, through just hearing so many other people's stories about what they've been through? I've learned that we need a reason. We've got to find a reason to live. And for a lot of men that I've spoken to, just looking after themselves isn't enough of a reason. They've had to do it for someone else in their life that they love for a a daughter or a partner or their community like having a reason to get up and 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 live we all need to have one and i think that that pretty much always comes from service and i think men and humans in general are happiest when we're of service to others like we need to feel like we have value to give and we need to feel like we're valued within society and if we don't have that if we're isolated if we're alienated if we feel like we're no use to anyone then it's only a hop skip and a jump to feeling like a burden and feeling like the world would be better off without you so i think that's a a major one is a reason to be here and that that can often be found outside of ourselves and i think that's particularly difficult in our western society today where we're so materialistic We're so individualistic. We're so based on how can you one up the person next to you and how can you get yourself to a better position, a higher status so that you can dominate others rather than how can you contribute to your community and how can you have your contribute, have your community contribute back to you and how can you be part of an ecosystem? And I think that's how human beings have thought for many thousands of years in the past and that that was actually much better for us from that sort of tribal perspective where we were connected to nature we were connected to each other and now even though technology is so far advanced i think we're more disconnected than ever and that with that comes a lack of reason a lack of belonging a lack of purpose and that is something that we're really struggling with so we have to be able to find a reason in service in others as men to want to get up in the morning and and make stuff happen we should want to just look after ourselves and it's really important that we do but i think everyone that i've spoken to they've need a they've needed more of a reason than just them yeah and there's actually a psychological component um, or concept there it's adlerian psychology that talks about like happiness can stem from or it stems from feeling like you're contributing to the world and that's what makes you feel valued and feel important I would say you're contributing in one way to the world by what you're doing and the platform that you're creating and potentially the lives that you're saving and impacting. Do you ever look back and think about, you know, they always say like a boat, if you change its direction by one degree over the course of its total journey, it'll be in a totally different spot. Do you ever think about how this event in your life totally shifted the direction of your life and the way that you're contributing to the world? Yeah, I guess it's that's the funny thing is the podcast that I do and the contribution that I've been able to make through it is the thing that I'm proudest of in my entire life. And that would have never happened had I never lost my good friend, which is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. So, you know, that's an odd thing to grapple with in your mind and to sit at his gravestone the other day and think about what I've created and what he would think of that and be proud of that and then have the mix of emotion knowing that he can't be here for it because he's the reason that I did it and it's a bit of a mind fuck man really thinking about that but look I think you you can only play the cards you're dealt I would never have chosen to lose my friend but I had a, a choice which people don't have to create a community service initiative out of a tragedy but that's what I chose to do and it's done a tremendous amount of good and I'm extremely proud of that and I know he would be as well and look yeah my life could have gone a very different direction I I almost didn't move back to my hometown I almost got uh, another job which would have sent me to another part of the country and I would have stayed on a different trajectory and I wouldn't be where I am now I would have never done podcasting 
But you know what? I, I wouldn't want to be anyone different to who I am now. And I've found real purpose and meaning in what I do. And I'm so grateful for that. And that makes me totally at peace with what's happened, knowing that I can't control that, but I can control how I've responded and what I've managed to make. And I've learned that I want to be someone who sparks conversations and does things that have meaning and that that is more important to me professionally than anything else. And I'm sure the medium with which I interview people and have discussions and contribute will change over time. But I know this is my thing and I'm, I'm grateful that I found it, even though it was through tragedy. You know, we've had over 50 conversations since we started this show. That's, in my opinion, probably one of the most, if not the most beautiful, if not, I mean, and most beautifully articulated uh, takes that I've, I've heard in a conversation. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, right on. Thanks, now. fellas. You're gassing me up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it comes in so many different forms, but it just reminds me of turning your pain into purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of things that at, at points we never choose, but again, to your point, we can only do with the cards that were dealt and um, choosing to turn something so tragic into something that's impacting hundreds and thousands. And I'm sure you have lofty goals of people in a positive light and hopefully pre preventing stuff that happened to you for, for so many other people is is such a is such a gift. And I'm just curious, like, I was going to ask you what you're most proud of, but you kind of answered it in the podcast. Um, but how do you show up differently in the world, I guess, pre, you know, the obviously the tragic event and like post tragic event, just like, have, in terms of how you feel, the, just like the way you approach people, the way you view the world, I'm just curious, like how, how that's evolved. Yeah, I think, and not just, not just the death of my friend, but over these last five years, I've grown, I've grown up a lot. I've, I've quietened down a lot. Like I used to be a pretty crazy party boy, as I know you were, Matt, yeah. <laughs> in your heyday. So it was the guy sitting next to me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was very much that kind of front. I didn't feel like I was, I was faking it necessarily, but. I was all about being big and loud and being known as the party boy uh, and being crazy and having that be part of my identity and being like a uh, good human and, and having a good time and not trying to like hide some darkness or whatever. But that was kind of where I was at. And now I've just turned 30, been doing this for five years. I've had some, some tragedy that I've gone through and some tough times. and. I think it's uh, what we typically hear from men as we get older, although we're not much older yet, but I've just softened a bit. I'm, I listen more. I listen more. I talk less. I'm less the, uh, the wise man knows he knows nothing, right? I, I, the more I learn, the, the more I realize I don't know shit, even though I knew a lot more than before. And being humbled by that and also I've just got this hunger for knowledge that I, I never used to have. Like if I've got a spare moment, I'm reading books, I'm listening to podcasts, I won't go for a walk or a drive in the car without trying to gain some sort of knowledge. Uh, and then also I just read stuff for fun as well, for escapism. And so I, I guess I, I've got a, a hunger to make the most out of my opportunity that I've been given with life. And part of that is knowing that that opportunity can disappear just like that and just like it did for my friend. And when something like that happens, it makes you think like, well, fuck, I'm still here. I'm still here and look at all the gifts I've been given. I'm so blessed. And the least I can do is make the most of that and not put expectations upon myself that I need to conquer the world and I'll be a failure unless I become a billionaire and, and the, the Joe Rogan of Australia, like that would just be ridiculous and that's not the aim in lots of respects i've already achieved what i wanted to achieve i've created this show done 150 episodes i have people message me all the time saying that it helps them and it's made a big difference to their life and of course we've got goals we want to reach more people we want to have more of an impact but i i've already i've already done it so i try to uh, take the, the credit along the way and take the little wins as i go and not get too high and not get too low and understand that you're never going to get there 
wherever there is, rather than live with, oh, I'll be happy when, when I reach this certain point, then I'll, then I'll lay down to rest and I'll, and I'll start being happy. Like realizing that it's, it's the journey, as cliche as it is, all the cliches are true, man. Yeah. Uh, just trying to enjoy the journey and take the little wins along the way and understand what actually delivers me true contentment and a, a feeling of, of true purpose and leaning into doing that and being a good friend, a good partner, a good son, being as fit as I can and just being grateful that I, I'm able to be out here every day and be healthy while I can, man. Uh, beautifully said. I, so I'm going to give you a chance to boast a little. Give, give us a couple, because I, I love hearing about wins. Give us a couple little wins today, or even not today, but just recently. Let's hear it. Uh, gosh. Well, just I guess just the, just the, just the basics, man. Like, I've got a, a wonderful relationship with a fantastic partner. I'm happy for that every single day. I've got a, a full-time job that I'm happy to get out of bed and, and go and work at. Uh, I have the, uh, the ability to go to the gym just about every day and, and get the workout in and, and feel good afterwards. I can afford to put high quality food into my body. I've got good relationships with my friends. I get to see my family all the time. Uh, I have this podcast where I get to have these conversations like you guys have with guys I would never ever get to talk to who just don't know me from a bar of soap but come in and share the hardest things they've ever been with with me because they trust me to be able to hold that space for them like you guys do. That's a huge privilege. and. All of these things are all the boxes that I feel like everyone's trying to tick and mine are ticked and I don't have these massive lofty ambitions of it needing to be much more than that. I think, uh, I think, I've, <laughs> I think I've figured it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not really. But I, uh, I, know, I know what makes me wake up and feel satisfied with life and it's, the, it's those simple things. It's, it's health, it's the people, uh, it's feeling like I can do something to contribute, and I've got I've got all of that happening, man. So I, I just want to hold on to that. So for me, for me, those I'm, are the. I'm wins. so I'm so pumped up for you, man. That 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 like warmed my heart hearing that because guys, that's that's what's called living in a state of gratitude. I mean, you really just named a, a, like nine things you were grateful for, and they were. I mean, they're not little things, but those are wins. Yeah, yeah, those, those are wins, and 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 that's what that's what a fulfilled human being. Uh, looks like right there, and sounds like, and and someone that com- yeah, and sounds like, and comes from a place uh, of of being connected to themselves, um, and from a place of love. Uh, you know it, what? It, one thing is, guys, that I want to mention, and thank you, Matt. That's that's really nice of you to say that, and that's certainly how I feel right now. The other thing is, it doesn't stay that way. You know, yeah. every day we've got to make the right decisions. Every day we've got to put in the work so that we can hopefully get into a state where we feel satisfied and 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 stay there. The other thing that I've done that has been so crucial for my, my mental state and my knowing of myself is I've just cut out the bullshit from my life. Like I used to do a lot of, a lot of little bullshit like um, you know, having, having big blowout party nights because I felt like I deserved it or uh, you know, uh, watching, watching porn or, or gambling occasionally, like all these kinds of things that kind of cheapen you and, and you know like deep down you can feel it no one else is going to know but you're going to know those things i've cut those things out of my life and that was one of the best decisions that i've ever made because i can look in the mirror and be like you're giving it everything all the time and i can have total respect for myself and that permeates the rest of your life rather than walking around knowing that you're doing shit that isn't good for you that other people don't know about but you can get away with it if you can cut that stuff out of your life you're going to go to another level you're going to love yourself all the more and that speaks to your character, um, what, do, doing what you do when no one else is watching. Uh, Cal, thank you so much for coming on here, man. This was such a just a, an inspiring conversation, and it's just so cool to see someone shine such a bright light um, and make and make so much good out of out of a tragic event. So uh, I just want to commend you for all the work that you're doing. Obviously, thank you for having me on your show. Uh, I, I'm always appreciative of the chance to to get to speak to to share my story a little bit. So uh, we're going to sign off here, but Cal, thank you so much. And MD, I'll let you, let you give your flowers as well. No, oh, yeah, Cal, like I said, one of the better uh, conversations and um, just from feeling like I'm, I'm there with you, just kind of step by step, just understanding and relating so much to what you said. So, um, you know, I think my only two senses, 
love the way you talked about winning. You know, I think we sometimes have these lofty ambitions and um, sometimes we lose sight of the way that we've already won. So it's a good reminder for me. Appreciate you, man. Hell yeah. Thanks for creating the, the space for me to talk, guys. I'm, I'm glad to hear it came across that way. It wasn't just me rambling in an Australian accent while your listeners are like, what is, what is this guy saying, man? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, man. first of all, I love the Australian accent. So, all right, Cal, we appreciate you, man. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys.